Welcome everyone to the Florida Food Dialogues, an occasional feature of the Florida Food Policy Council and the Florida Food Forum. With us uh, for today's discussion uh, is Art Friedrich, uh, president of Urban Oasis in Miami, Florida. Uh, we're honored and uh, really uh, happy to have him with us. Uh, he brings so much to the discussion of the Florida food system and a deep personal commitment to improving the lives of folks in his community through food and through improvements in the food system. I want to share just a bit about the philosophy of Urban Oasis. Art tells us on the website that we believe that good, clean, healthy food should be accessible to all. So we run farmers markets, we plant gardens with low income families, and we support many local farms by bringing their produce to markets. In past years, we ran our own farms, but we are focusing on all the other parts of our mission this year. Urban Oasis Project prides itself in being an inclusive nonprofit organization, embracing all people who support our mission, regardless of religious preferences, sexual orientation, economic status, ethnicity, age, or disability. Urban Oasis experiments with all gardening and farming philosophies that do not harm the environment. And so in this spirit, we welcome Art to our discussion today. And joining me um, is Kendra Love uh, from Florida Food Policy Council, the administrator of the council. And we're going to talk with Art a little bit about what he's doing and what he's done, and perhaps more importantly, why he's doing what he's doing right now. So Art, if you would, to uh, uh, begin our session, maybe if you can tell us a little bit of, about yourself, your background, your experiences, and what brought you to this particular moment. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to get to talk about it and talk about our history. Urban Oasis Project, we've been here in Miami for 10, almost 11 years now. And it really was created when I moved here to Miami and met a woman named Melissa Contreras, who was working in Fire Child Gardens and, you know, really wanted to put out this message of that we need to be growing more food and less lawns. Um, my background, I came from, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, so really grew up in the Midwest, lived in, lived in St. Louis, Missouri for a long time created a community center there. And as part of that community center, we had started a little community garden um, and just was really great to see the response of so many different people to that community garden. It was a real way to interact and build a bridge with the local kids in the neighborhood where the community center was. Um, and from before that, I mean, in high school, I had gotten involved in things like the environmental club, um, I had gone vegetarian and I had gone vegan because I'd really read a lot about the environmental impacts of industrial farming. And so food issues to me really bring together some really core things. I mean, for one, it's just a universal, important aspect of our lives. It's one of the most intimate aspects of how we live, like what we're buying and putting into our bodies to feed ourselves. And it can really be a way that can address so many of the different disparities that we see. I mean, our country was built upon slave labor and creating farms and agriculture systems built on the oppression of other people. And we still see a lot of parallels to that today. Uh, Farm workers being severely underpaid, mistreated, you know, retained as undocumented illegals. And so, like, mistreated because of all those categories, still run the entire food system on for the most part. So the flip side of that, where people can really, on a personal level, like, grow their own garden and really nourish themselves. Um, and so Urban Oasis Project kind of brings together a lot of those ideas that we can create a more just and more economically viable system for small and local farmers, especially um, in our communities in Miami and in Florida in general. Um, we can promote better public health by making sure that that produce, that fresh produce is going directly from farms to people 
highlighting the, the you know, economic disparities that people are living with. So getting it to the low-income people, giving them access to the fresh produce, combating food deserts, making it more affordable in different ways and tactics to make it more affordable and more appealing to those folks. And then at the same time, you know, that creates an environmental protection benefit by promoting small farms that can have the flexibility to be more environmentally sustainable. Um, but they're all ideals that um, have to be kind of brought together and work together. That's great, Art. Um, tremendous. I want to uh, engage with you kind of on two tracks today. Uh, one is kind of the broad ethical and philosophical, maybe even political dimension of your work, but then also kind of uh, the more nitty gritty grassroots uh, aspects of it. I want to begin with kind of the grassroots work and um, if you could uh, tell us a little bit or highlight um, a, a specific project or two that has been successful uh, for you uh, at the Urban Oasis. So, yeah, we've been doing things for 11 years now in Miami. So we've done a lot of different things. And we're really a very small organization. Often I've been the only full-time employee. Um, and then often we have one, two or three others. Our kind of biggest effort was we partnered with the Homeless Trust and Car for Supportive Housing to create the Verde Gardens Farm Market. So they created a assisted housing um, community down in Homestead um, on 23 acres that used to be the Air Force Base. And as part of that, most of it was a farm. So they created all these permanent assisted housing units, and then we created a farm market to um, provide food access and also just jobs and job training for, for the people that moved in there. A lot of what we do now is we run farmers markets in Miami. So we bring farms when we can to the markets and then we do what we can to grow some of our own stuff when we have the capacity and we buy from a bunch of local farms and we highlight that every week on our newsletter, links on our website um, and um, labeling markets. Can folks subscribe to your newsletter easily? Can they get to it off of your website? Yeah, real easy off the front page of our website. Uh, there's a newsletter sign up right there. Uh, so that's just urbanoasisproject.org. Some years ago, uh, uh, a columnist, a journalist for the uh, Tampa Bay Times had a terrific article that I just want to mention here because I think folks can still get it online. Uh, the Journalist was Laura Riley, and her series was called From Farm to Fable, which exposed the uh, excesses of the farm to table movement, in which restaurants were promoting farm to table dishes, but the food was coming from the industrial food system. And local yeah. farmers markets, so called farmers markets, were promoting them as local foods. And yet, uh, in the middle, of <laughs> in the middle of summer in Florida, they were having apples that clearly were coming from Washington or from Michigan, uh, and foods from you know from around the world. So I'm very impressed with your commitment to establishing genuine farmers markets uh, in Miami and in the vicinity down there. I mean, I'm curious if there was any resistance or pushback um, from others um, regarding that that policy or regarding that project that you worked on to really make genuine farmer markets. Because here in this area, for example, there was pushback, uh, especially among folks that were used to going to farmers markets and getting food from around the world, out of season stuff. And they said, I'm not ever gonna come back here again. You just don't have what I want. I'm just curious yeah. what your experience was on that, Art. So we definitely have had to be very careful about curating who is selling at our markets. And then generally, um, our Oasis project, because we aggregate produce from so many different farms, we do have a lot available. But especially during the summer, there's just very little, um, there's very little vegetable, but we have tons of fruits. You know, we just let people know in the summer, fruits are going to be local. Vegetables are labeled about where they come from. So we've been able to use that year-round market and labeling to help push local farms to grow more, whereas it may not be, you know, commercially viable on a huge things that um, are kind of more from the permaculture uh, thread of things. So we can grow katuk and different things like that and see if, you know, people are interested in buying those to, you know, eat more local produce um, that's in season here. 
possible. And a lot of our mission is to also improve public health. So we do a lot of programs that are specifically geared towards getting food to low-income folks. We do get things from farther away, and we do get things from the conventional kind of food chain um, so that we can maximize the nutritional value getting to these people whose you know primary concern is food and nutrition, is right. not supporting a whole alternative food system that we need to be creating. It all kind of works together to build a more cohesive and adaptable um, you know, program for us. Yeah, be- beautifully said, Art. Um, and you've touched on a, several topics that actually raise um, uh, kind of philosophical issues uh, related to uh, nutrition, the food system, and also uh, making sure that folks uh, that may be in disadvantaged communities are able to get wholesome, nutritious food. Uh, I want to return to that in a moment, but before doing that, I want to highlight uh, a couple of the foods that you mentioned, because this is kind of the practical side of our discussion, some of the foods that can be grown here in quantity that can supply markets, at least on a small scale. And I think you mentioned some of the bok choys, uh, and I think you mentioned okra, uh, but could you just review very very briefly some of the foods, uh, produce that you, uh, Urban Oasis and the team has been able to grow uh, in Miami so that others who may be interested in doing something like this can do it themselves, either in their own homes, on their home gardens, or perhaps if they envision doing a program similar to what you're doing there. So could you just review with us what the major kind of summer food uh, uh, produce could be, food production items could be uh, in your part of the world, uh, Southern Florida? Um, I mean, I myself never managed a, a farm by myself. So when we ran our farm, we hired a farm manager who trained at Warden Farm over in Punta Gorda, great, huge organic farm. They do amazing big things. And so they trained a farmer that we hired and he was able to run our farm. And so some of the local farms would probably be able to speak better to that, like Cool Running Farm and just the folks that are now down at Redland uh, Community Farm. But great things to grow in the summer, like um, calabasas and seminal pumpkins. We grew thousands of pounds accidentally one year, which we were then able to harvest in August and September and keep them in, you know, a cool storage for three months as we worked our way through just growing what was kind of an accidental cover crop as the farm was transitioning between managers. You know, yucca is great to grow in the summer. It does really well. Um, A bunch of the different Asian greens like the bok choys, okra, collards. Um, you know, I've seen lacinato kale, the Italian dinosaur kale. I've grown that through the summer. I've grown that for two years at a time. So I've let it get to four feet tall and it was, it was great. Um, you know, especially when you're able to not just be a five acre open field, but you're able to grow where there's maybe some other trees for some shade or some buildings to give some partial shade or put up a shade house, which is one thing that we built at uh, Verde Farm, and then be able to grow indoors or you know semi-indoors under the shade house to limit the amount of intense sun that we get. Because we just get so much sun. Things burn up. It's too hot and humid for things to cool off and transpire for the plant to cool itself down. So you really have to have some plants that are well adapted to the environment. That's great, Art. Um, and I, for the folks that are listening to this, uh, let me just contextualize this just a bit. Art has presented himself as not really a farmer, uh, but someone that has worked closely with farmers, in fact, was responsible for hiring a farmer to manage the farms that they had. And yet he just in the last two minutes, went through a half dozen or more different crops that offer high yield in the summer. I'm blown away by the thousand pounds of Seminole pumpkins <laughs> that were a summer crop in Florida. What so many folks report, because Florida, as you know, is an immigrant state. Uh, we have immigrants from all over the world, but especially from northern parts of the United States that come here And the sad song that they'll always give you is you can't grow anything in Florida in the summer. And of course, we know that's a fiction. That's fake news. (laughs) Uh, You can grow in Florida and you can can grow in quantity. The Seminole pumpkins, you mentioned the yucca plants. You've even had success with uh, lacinato kale and with collards. Um, And certainly, I I suspect you've had a lot of success with okra, uh, which is a a great Florida favorite and a very high high production uh, crop. Um, and 
Art is sharing that simply on the basis of his working with the food system and observing what's being done on the farms that he's engaged with. So this is a story for all of us to take home and take away from this is that indeed in Florida, you can grow a tremendous number of food, high yield food production crops all throughout the summer. And in terms of being able to meet the needs of communities, that's what's really important. You need to get the foods that are not just uh, food products that you can grow, uh, you know, in your backyard or on a small plot, but that you can produce in quantity so that you can actually make a difference in the food supply. And that's what art is doing down at uh, Ur uh, Urban Oasis uh, in the Miami area. Um, Kendra, I want to uh, open this up to you for uh, any questions that you might have for art or ideas that you would want to run by him. So Art, I'm wondering if there are any specific gaps or challenges that you think that we could address using policy. Yeah, um, I mean, first I want to start with a great resource for people to go really deep. And actually, you know, it's one that I pulled off of a recent floor of Food Policy Council um, email was for the uh, HEAL um, Foundation. Um, but they're, you know, a really multicultural, group uh, led by people of color that has got a, a, an amazing analysis of the many, many different facets of the food system and the areas where injustices are occurring and like uh, solutions, things that they're advocating for. So, I mean, I've been just educating myself the last week from that website. It's so well put together. It's visual, it's graphic, um, as well as just a huge amount of thought in that. So I really encourage people to look to that and to look to, um, you know, especially other organizations led by people of color, um, like Soul Fire Farm, um, that are really trying to, you know, push ideas that are more often informed by, um, you know, the people that are affected most by the injustices in the food system. Like what we've seen and like one of our tactics is, you know, just connecting more people to food and, um, and empowerment through food. So helping people start their own gardens and grow some of their own food is a really basic kind of, um, you know, starting block for, for people to recognize the impact of food on their own lives, uh, to people recognize the agency that they can have in growing some of their own food. Um, and, you know, really just enjoy the process of food more. There's so many cultural changes that need to be made where, yes. you know, we've seen for so long pushing food from being a source of kind of value and importance to being just a commodity. Yes. That's how we talk about it. To food being just fuel for the body. Um, and, you know, it's kind of sweeps under the rug a lot of the, I mean, really valuable aspects of food that it's what connects us to cultural heritage and it connects these together. And so often we see, you know, things like the church meal are, you know, that's the most important part of the church service in a lot of places because that's where people can actually come together, meet each other, share food. I mean, it's such an important thing. Um, and so, you know, kind of re-elevating food as such an important thing every day, uh, you know, bringing back the just cooking dinner at home, um, making sure that people have enough time in their lives to be able to cook some of their own meals. Um, you know, if people are working 40, 60, 80 hour weeks, they don't always have time to cook enough of their own meals um, to be able to eat healthy. Um, okay, let me pick up on that for a minute, Art. Um, you, you touched on a couple of issues that are uh, kind of, I think, fundamental, uh, very basic to uh, the kind of cultural change that would be necessary to have not only a more sustainable food system, but also address some of the systemic challenges that are present in underserved communities. Um, one term that you used was the commodification of food, which has happened on a dramatic scale, on a massive scale, especially in certainly my lifetime. And I think I'm a little bit older than you and Kendra, but I've seen it in the course of my lifetime. The commodification of food on the one, one hand, the overworked American uh, to, um, to borrow an oft used term in economic analysis, that we are overworked, having to work 30, 40, uh, 50 or more hours a week, that we have very little time to spend with our family and with our communities. And then third, you brought up religion, um, somewhat in passing, but I think in a very profound way, that very often the religious community 
is uh, historically at least has been a source not only for community and conviviality but also a source for food yeah. so this is where people went and ate together and shared a meal that's how you begin to develop those culture but if you look at those three elements um being overworked the commodification of food and the loss not just of religious community but community in general where people shared time together around food all three of those elements have been severely affected um, by um, our culture of the last 50 years or so, but especially the last 20 or so years. It seems difficult to me uh, as, uh, uh, you know, as a researcher in this area to see how exactly we begin to make those inroads. The point you make is good, and, and I celebrate it, that we need to begin to encourage people to do the gardening. We do need to encourage people to take a little bit more time around the dinner table. Yet it seems that we're up against just a tsunami of uh, cultural forces that make those kinds of acti activities very, very difficult to sustain. So I don't want to problematize it too much, but I do want to uh, suggest that the, the, the challenges are indeed dramatic and what it might take to begin to reverse those challenges. You mentioned a couple. Do you have any other thoughts along those lines, specifically in those three areas? Um, commodification of food, um, uh, the overworked American, and the loss of the cultural institutions that bring people together around food. What would be something that we might do to be able to address that? Um, locally, perhaps, but maybe more general, more generally in a cultural sense. Uh, I mean, it's tough. Um... Some of it is just, you know, kind of changing our value system, um, you know, where we place our values. Um, you know, more and more people are watching more food programs on TV than they are cooking their own food. Even as the cooking programs have risen in popularity, um, people are cooking less and less of their own food. So, you know, I, <laughs> people got to turn their TVs off more and... Um, <laughs> take care of themselves better um but that is such a value that people have to you know watch tv all the time and stay up on the latest shows but um i mean people just uh taking some of their power back and uh yeah. excellent art you know here on uh, <laughs> the florida food dialogue we don't duck the hard questions and we we don't hesitate to raise the really uh, troublesome and and challenging questions and uh your initial response was yeah there's there's some challenges there, but I think as you worked through that and thought about it further, you hit on a lot of really helpful and insightful observations about what can be done. For example, lifting up the prestige or at least the profile of the farmer. Um, we talk about how in education, the teachers are devalued within our culture. Well, so are the farmers. Um, yeah. As we work for programs that would try to uplift the status of teachers, we can do the same thing with with farmers, with local growers, with the person that devotes their life to this kind of activity. Um, you hit on, and I just wanna reinforce this, the idea of federal subsidies that would be directed to farmers that are working, especially in urban environments. The USDA sends tremendous billions and billions of dollars to large scale industrial farming, and yet very little is diverted into urban agriculture and local systems. Very little is, diverted into the education of the next generation of, of Americans. Um, how, much, uh, how much resource is devoted to agriculture in the public school system, for example? It used to be, it was not a, unusual in Florida to have an ag program in high schools, in most high schools in Florida, even in urban high schools. Today, they virtually have disappeared. That would be another area where work could be done. And think again for a moment, and I'm just riffing a little bit following up on what you said. Think a moment for a moment about land grant universities around the country, but let's talk about the state of Florida, the University of Florida. That's the land grant university. That's where agriculture happens. If you want to learn how to be a farmer, you go to the University of Florida. How many other universities in the state of Florida actually have agricultural programs? Not just a course about farming or food production or the history of food, but actually have hardcore, nitty gritty, boots on the ground, learn about the biology, learn about biomes, learn about what can be grown, serious developed agricultural programs at universities around this state. I don't think there's a one. I don't think there's a one. So we're educating tens of thousands of 
persons to become leaders in our society that know know nothing about agriculture and have had no exposure to it. That would be another area. Don't get me started. I can go on on, on some more. But what you've hit on, the points that you made about public policy, diverting resources into direct support of local growers, local property acquisitions, making grounds and properties available for folks to grow, would be overnight would make a tremendous difference. And yet there does not appear as of this moment, at least, a will to move in that direction from a policy perspective, but perhaps there could be. And folks like what, what folks like you are and what you're doing in your projects and some of the other projects around the state are beginning to make that difference. I think what, and maybe to, you know, think about our, our final observations on this is that all of us, folks like you and Kendra and other members of the Florida Food Policy Council, we, le we need to continue to lift our voices. We need to speak out and we need to speak to others about the importance of these projects and do whatever we can to get the attention of those that are making the policy decisions in the state. And if you can find that elected official or that, that uh, uh, person seeking elected office who will advocate for it, and we can ask those people, what is your position on urban agriculture? What is your position on diverting some of the resources into helping people grow their own food? What is your position on diverting resources so that uh, properties can be acquired to grow food in urban settings? And see if the, if the advocacy that we have can then be translated into political action by the government officials that we would support in their efforts to achieve a political position within the state, legislative position in the state. Um, those are things that, are, that can be done and can happen. Kendra, another question for Art, if you have. So for younger people who are interested in getting more involved with policy and engaging in the food system, do you have any suggestions how they can do that? I mean, that's a difficult question. It can be very... I feel like challenging to engage sometimes. We get a lot of requests for people to volunteer, which when we were running our own farm, you know, we were able to uh, use more volunteers, but in some ways it's often been difficult for us to engage a lot of volunteers. So we have our garden building program. And so we have, you know, we can always have like one or two folks come out at a time to help build gardens with us. But, you know, some really cool things that I've seen in other places. I mean, I know up in Orlando, they have the fleet farming network, people yes. doing gardens by bikes and riding around the city to kind of distributed network of gardens. And then I've also seen in other places, folks organizing crop mobs where they organize a big volunteer day and they go to a farm. And they, so they have a whole bunch of people at once, like 20, 30 people come out to a farm and just spend a day working on a farm together. It's a great way to like, learn some of the nitty gritty, get some experience of what it's like to be on a farm, you know, get to engage with the farmer and hopefully like create some really big tangible benefit to like accomplish some major project that the farmer needs to get done and, you know, help them be more sustainable. Um, so that can be a great way to do that. And then hopefully those crop mob groups can also be organized to like have a social hour and talk about policy issues as well. And different food policy councils um, in different areas. So food policy councils can be a great way to have some discussion and learn about those policy issues. Um, and going back to what Dell said earlier about um, politicians and policy, you know, part of what created that Miami-Dade Food Policy Council was my interaction with Daniela Levine Cava, who is now running to be mayor of Miami-Dade. So she's a really great sympathetic uh, politician who wasn't a politician then. She was running a nonprofit agency who has been, you know, on the ground working on these kinds of issues for, you know, well over 10 years. I'm sure way back before I knew her then, she was already, you know, she already knew what was going on with, um, you know, local food issues in Miami. Other ways to learn about and engage. Um, I mean, I, I think that's a lot of it, like volunteering with some local type of agricultural, you know, institution, looking for ways to tap in and volunteer. I mean, especially in South Florida, volunteering happens at a way lower rate than most of the rest of the entire country. So yeah. promoting civic engagement by way of volunteerism and, you know, giving your time is a great way to learn really one of the most important ways to learn. Like that is experiential learning. Yeah, beautifully said, Art. 
Um, I think that uh, to kind of follow up or enhance what you said, uh, in so many of these instances, what you mentioned, uh, both from fleet farming, as well as the Miami-Dade uh, Food Policy Council, as well as this Food Policy Council, is to work to develop the network of individuals who are committed uh, to be able to meet with others that share the vision and uh, develop strategy and tactics to get the word out. Uh, so often it seems, especially in Florida, that folks feel isolated, they feel alone, and maybe more so now with the challenges of the pandemic, that they don't realize that they're part of a larger group. If you're in an area where there isn't a group, you can start a group. You can reach out to other people. You can be the person that shows up at the Civic Center and you're the only one there on the first night, but maybe two more come. Maybe it's three the next night. It does begin that way and it can be a ripple effect. Absolutely. I mean, we started just by having potlucks um, yeah. for six months to a year. That was all we did was we had potlucks to get six to eight people together at a time. Uh, grow you know people generally were growing had their own gardens and so people would come together bring a few things that they grew and cooked up and just got together to create some kind of community around local food and that's you know that's all it took to start growing this organization to where then we're like oh we can plant gardens for some people right. and then that drew in a lot more people because everyone wanted to plant gardens and because we were serving uh you know we were meeting a need that we hadn't exactly realized so tangibly at the beginning, we hadn't like set that out as like, oh, this is what we need to do. But once we did one, we're like, oh, like this is really important work and we need to do more of this. And that just drew people like a magnet um, to where then, you know, six months later, another organization asked us to start a farmer's market in their community. And we said, sure, we can try to figure that out. So we did that because I did not want to be involved in nonprofit work again when I came to Miami. I was trying to have a real job that paid real money. Um, you know. Now, uh, we've developed to a point where I do make a decent salary, and that's great. But for a long time, you know, it was a labor of love. Right. And the labor of love now has translated into a viable economic adventure for you. That yeah. your, pro your program is successful and you're successful at it. And so I just want to say to everyone that may be listening to this or picking this up sometime in the future is this does work. It can be done. And there are stories like arts around the state and around the nation of folks that have just rolled up their sleeves, gotten involved, found what they love and committed themselves to it. And then a wonderful work evolves from that. A wonderful flower blooms as a result of the work that's, been, that's being done. I wanna just share one last thought too um, about youth, getting youth involved. Um, if you're in an organization or if you're working with other people, maybe you don't have an organization, but you just have a group that meets occasionally, um, think about perhaps reaching out to the local public schools. Um, many, many students um, are looking for opportunity to serve their community. Many uh, schools have programs where students actually have to be involved in some way in some sort of service to their community. If you can go to the guidance counselor, the administrator, the principal of the school and say, hey, did you know we have community gardens here? Or did you know that we have a farm to table dinner we do every month? We'd love to have some of the students in your school participate in this. That very, very often will open up the door to youth participation. And again, that's a model. And I've seen that model repeated um, uh, frequently um, in, our, in our region, in this part of the state, the Tampa Bay region. Going back to, um, uh, you know, similar to that, part of the way that I got involved in this kind of work too was when I was 20 years old, moving to St. Louis, engaging with the local farmer's market to get their food waste and then running a Food Not Bombs chapter to cook up all that food waste and just distribute, um, you know, good quality cooked food to homeless folks and to activists and support people that were in need with that food waste. And so that was a big part of how, you know, another part of how I got into this kind of stuff. And now it's come full circle where I'm now supporting a Food Not Bombs chapter here, okay. which is feeding over 400 homeless people every week during the pandemic with healthy, safe, hot meals. And so that's been really great to be able to be supportive of that. And also, you know, the important thing is it's not going to be a get rich quick scheme for anyone. It's going to take, you know, you can't cut corners. You have to create authenticity. It's going to take a lot of time. And that does take, you know, personal resources. That takes capital. 
Um, so luckily I had a partner that could support me for a few years while all this got off the ground because I did not have any capital whatsoever. Um, so, you know, finding ways to support, um, you know, a lot of the groups here, they actually had initial support from stimulus dollars from the 2008 recession, um, that the health department put out. And so that allowed farmers markets to get started. And yeah, a lot of them fail, but you know what? A lot of businesses, most businesses fail. So yes. it's not surprising, even if it's a great, you know, meaning for to be good intention kind of business, like it may still fail. Like you have to have that right mix between, you know, meeting a need that is there in the community and a community that is able to get that need met. That's well said, uh, Art. Um, I would like to ask you if you were meeting with someone for the first time who expressed uh, marginal interest, said, I'm kind of interested in doing something uh, to make the world better through food. Uh, what would be the one guidance that you would give that person? Uh, the person comes off the street, they say, hey, Art, I've heard about the great work that you're doing. I'd like to do a little bit to make a difference. What would be the one guidance that you would give to that person? Um, I mean, if, <laughs> if they're just getting started, they want to stay small, stay easy. I mean, I say just cook a meal for a neighbor, bring, you know, bring one person a meal, use some good quality ing ingredients. It's going to take a little creativity. It's going to take a little, you know, it'll be a little challenge. Um, but it's a great way to connect with someone, connect with someone new, hopefully, um, support someone in need and, um, start really small. All right. I love that guidance. Cook a meal for a neighbor, use high quality ingredients, and share your interests with them. Um, I can't think of something better myself to say. Uh, Art, Art Friedrich, we appreciate the work that you're doing. We appreciate your commitment, your lifetime of commitment to this work. Your work is an inspiration, and you personally are an inspiration to everyone that's involved in this work. I, mean, I really appreciate that. I mean, I love, I'm very blessed to be able to do the work that I do. Um, you know, it's me here talking today, but my inspiration comes from so many people around me, from so many people that are leading the movements for environmental justice, for racial justice, um, for food justice. Um, you know, most of Urban Oasis Project is made up of women of color, and they're the real people that are doing so much of the work. And so, you know, I just can't thank them enough for all their dedication and their leadership. And to everyone around, you know, some of the organizations we named today and so many more people that are really, you know, working hard to make a world that is livable for all of us. So, you know, the inspiration, it, it comes from all around um, when we look at the people that are taking leadership and value them. Beautifully said, Art. Thank you for having me today. And again, for those that are interested in supporting Art's work, there's a link to Urban Oasis and Art's project on the Florida Food Policy Council website. You can go there and make a donation to Art's work in the community. And I also do want to mention that um, Florida Food Policy Council is also a not-for-profit organization, and we really survive it all through the goodwill and the donations of folks as well. So these are not-for-profit organizations that really are making a difference, that are driven by people of heart and passion, commitment and integrity, like Art and Kendra and the rest of our Florida Food Policy Council community. So please do support us uh, to the degree that you possibly can. And if you can't share uh, resources, share the idea with others and our website. Thank you all, and thanks for being part of this discussion. Bye now.